Mark, welcome to the show. Really excited to have you on. Sounds like you have had some unique experiences with employees as far as longevity, how long they've been with you and how you engage them, but you're also doing some great stuff. Why don't you introduce yourself to the audience? Let them know what you're up to. Yeah, thank you. Honored to be here. Yeah, so Mark Reichmath, I'm one of the founders and CEO of Speedy Tech. We're an all digital agency. We've got locations in uh, five cities, which kind of sounds silly now, but about 38 of our 170 team members are truly remote, but we're kind of all remote today. So I actually started the business when I was a junior in college, which no qualifications, obviously. You know, we talk a lot about culture and core values. We made it till 2008 before we even realized that we had a culture. Uh, we were just really focused <laughs> on building websites and doing some of the digital stuff. And over time, we started to address it, formalize it, write it down. And, you know, 2008, we were maybe 10 people. Today, we're 170. So you were forced to make some of those things and, and make it more tangible and formal, which we've done a great job of. And I think that's led to some of those foundational things of keeping great talent, attracting great talent, and also attracting really great clients. We do a lot of digital work, like I said, lead generation, but I think you have to have a great team to accomplish that. So we've got clients in all 50 states, 20 plus countries, and we're just really passionate about doing a great digital marketing. Now, I'm curious, Mark, it, although you were only 10 people in 2008, you say you really hadn't defined the culture yet. It doesn't sound like it's enough people where this would happen, but I do find in some companies when they haven't clearly defined it, and once again, you had a strong one, so it's even less potential this was an issue. But sometimes when a company hasn't defined a culture, they have like two or three or more different cultures going on based on right. the personalities involved. Did you have any of that going on or was everybody pretty much on the same page? You know, we were in basically one location at the time. So everybody's in the same office. So it's easy to kind of have everybody fall in line with the same belief system of what that is. But in 2008, you know, we did start to say, why are we doing this? Why aren't we doing that? And that was a good conversation to start to have with the team, with ourselves. We, we made it 10 years with no turnover. We still have four out of our five first team members. So we knew even then we were like, well, we're eight years in, we haven't lost anybody. What are we doing right? And, and we were on a plane actually back from South by Southwest, the interactive portion of that in Austin, and just started to have that conversation. Why do we, why do we require ourselves to dress this way? Why do we like, and, and we were also fortunate. We never worked for the man in the real world. So <laughs> we just started to say, if we don't want to work here, who else would want to work here? So we kind of had this unwritten rule. If we're not having fun, if we don't like it, we're not going to work here either, which is just a kind of a common sense approach of, Let's make this a great place to work that is great for us and the team, and everybody should be happy. Well, so, so it sounds like you kind of had a club where everybody's on the same page, everybody enjoys each other. So th that also begs the question, although maybe I'm jumping ahead, how easy has it been for, for people who have different personalities or backgrounds or, or even you know women to join? I don't know how many women you had in the original 10. To, to join in and feel comfortable and really embrace the culture and then contribute to it. Yeah. So, I mean, I think over time, as you get bigger, that definitely changes. I mean, listen, brutally honest, we were a bunch of dudes in the beginning because it was programming and we tried to hire women, but just we probably also weren't really attracting them. Today, I'm proud to say we're over 50% female, which is great. We've got a good balance and I love that. So, but every person you hire, I mean, there is personality differences, but I think it's about how you mend those together, regardless of other things, just how do those personalities work together? And so I believe we've done a really good job of kind of honing in on what that DNA of who we are as a company is, and really staying true to hiring people within that, that window and not getting so arrogance, ego, ladder climbers. There's some specific things that we really try to weed out and aside from that, it's just the best person for the job. If you're a good culture fit and you have skills or close to the skills we could even teach or train, we're good. But that number one thing is that culture and core values fit. And so that's the first phone call from a screening perspective is just all about culture. We don't think they could be the best whatever, best SEO person, best paid media person. If they've got a little twinge of arrogance that we think is going to rub them, the team wrong, they're out. It's interesting because it reminds me of an article you may have seen it that Norm Brodsky wrote years ago, where he he would hire and he had to, he figured he had to interview I think it was twenty five people 
But the but his first interview was the same way. He spent like a half an hour talking about culture. And the way he boiled it down was he said, if they were interested, if they were asking questions, if they were sitting on the edge of their seat, this was before the Zoom calls, you know, then I know I got someone who might work out. If they're falling asleep or they seem bored or whatever, then I just end the interview and it's just not going to be a match. So, totally. We only hired last year, we only hired 0.06% of applicants. So now that can be frustrating for the applicant because we do have a strong or stringent process that's long. But we have to stay true to that. You can't just put butts in seats. Like the, so we hire, fire, manage, and solve problems by our core values. And, and so I think if there's an advice I could give to an entrepreneur, somebody starting the, the journey, why you need to have formalized core values like we didn't <laughs> is because it, it's just such a great framework for all those things I said. And, and it's going to save you from a lot of other problems that you will unintentionally create by not having them formalized. Yeah. So what are your core values? Yeah. I'm glad you asked. So we have four <laughs> and this has evolved over time. I would say we used to have more and we kind of slowly condensed them into more impactful yeah. sort of ones. So our first one, and this is kind of our Notre Dame sign we tap before we enter the field of work every day, we get better every day. So that's, that's this motto of, we don't want to tread water. We don't want to just maintain. We want to be taking steps forward and getting better. The second one is we do the right thing. Even when it's the hard thing, even when it's going to take longer, we, just, we do the right thing. Third is we over me. That's probably my personal favorite. So we say team member, not employee. And this is all about being a team player. You're here to do great work with others, make the team around you better, make your clients better, stuff like that. And then we own it. We own our bosses. We own our wins. We own our work, we own our deadlines, our timelines, stuff like that. So they're all actionable. They're all lived. I think that's an important thing too. A lot of companies have aspirational core values or culture. And I can very confidently say that these are all lived things for us. So I teach that there's four company culture cornerstones. So there's your mission, your vision, your values, and people know all those, but they don't know the fourth. And the fourth is accountability to live them out. So talk to us a little bit about how you maintain that accountability in an encouraging, but you can't cross this line, you know, type of mode. Yeah. Well, like I said, we hire and fire by it. So if there's a pretty major offense, it could lead to a termination. But on a positive note, like our Slack channel, we have a specific shout out channel on Slack. And when people give shout outs, they also include what core values it aligned with, which I think is beautiful. It's a great way to just have those core values prominent in everything you do. Like I said, we hire Byron, so we, we also ask questions, but I do a cultural onboarding, hopefully day one with every new team member where I deliver them. If it's important to me as a leader, it should come from me. That's a great piece of advice I got a long time ago. So I go through them, give some stories behind it, ask if they have any questions. It's great when we interact on it. And, and accountability is a very common thread of all four of those that we talk about. And then we talk about having those tough conversations. It is the responsibility of every team member to defend our core values and our culture. Now, as a leader, I say for myself, I have to have that one 100%. I can't have an off day where I don't follow those core values. I have to show to the team that I've got a perfect record with them. If I yell at you and mistreat or do something that's against our core values, I've now just given everybody else that witnessed that permission to do the same thing. And that's not okay as a leader. Like, so... It's important as leaders, especially to just be perfect, perfectly aligned with those core values and live them truly. So let's say somebody violates, uh, let's say I'm a peer or I, I notice a peer violating one of the values. Do you train them how to approach that person to question so, that? Yeah, I actually just sent this out. I do a weekly video. So when COVID hit, changed communication patterns, I started making a weekly video, which has been great. And one of the things I did, three, four weeks ago is I, I told the team, we all need to make sure we're giving each other permission for that feedback. And so I gave them permission on that video. I said, you all have my permission to hold me accountable. If I'm doing something you believe is out of line with our core values, call me out on it. You have my permission to give me that feedback. And you all need to give your direct teams, your manager, the client account teams that you work on with different clients, that same permission so that we that feedback is critical. I'll use, I love the sporting analogy of that. You have a basketball game going on. We zero out the crowd noise. The players are yelling at each other. The coaches are yelling and it's yelling because of the setting, but 
they're giving that constant and immediate feedback. We should be doing the same. If we want to truly get better every day, we have to do that. And it is a hard human thing to do because it's uncomfortable. And none of us like to be told we, we weren't perfect, right? But we have to give permission. We attack the problem, not the person. I love that saying. Attack the problem, not the person. And it's just a nice framework to say, like, we're not attacking David or Mark. I'm saying, David, I want to help you get better. Do you want to do you want to get better? Yes. Okay. In this meeting, I noticed X. And then also offering, I am willing to be part of the solution. Do you want me to help hold you accountable to that? Do you want to check in? Is there something I can provide to you? And what does each person in, in, involved in that want to do to help solve that problem? Yeah. Do you also teach them to, to ask questions when they're doing that accountability? So like I noticed in this meeting, you did X. Um, it seems to me like it's counter to our value of Y. Can you explain to me what your thought process was there? Yeah. You know, I think I would approach it that way. We haven't necessarily trained people to think specifically like that. I think different personalities will, will do it differently. And that may be best for the different situations. But I do love solving problems with the questions uh, to hopefully understand where they're coming from, different perspectives. But yeah, you know, the core values, you solve those problems. And it's like, how do we get realigned to those core values and, and move forward from there? Yeah, interesting. So when you're in the hiring process, you have this first phone or Zoom interview. Do you do it phone or via Zoom? Do you require Zoom so you can see the person? As far as I know, they're doing Zoom. I, I believe we're, we probably still call it a phone uh, screen. Yeah, but I'm okay. pretty sure it's still, it's, everything we're doing is over Zoom. Yeah, yeah, I would think so. So t- talk to us a little bit about some of the specifics of how you're testing for culture in that interview. Like what questions are you asking or are you talking through the culture or what are the pieces to that puzzle? Yeah. So, you know, at our size, I'm not involved in those early stage ones anymore. So I can't say specifically, but what I know the types of things we would do is we're just trying to get that conversation going to having them talk about their experiences. What role did you play in that? And seeing if they're going to latch on to only what Mark did. And is it I like, are you using a lot of I and me? Or are you saying like, well, I was part of a team. That's a different, or we were doing this. I specifically did this part, but my team did this. So there's different way you're taking maybe ownership. And that's difficult in in an interview because people want, they're trying to sell themselves, but really trying to understand how they've handled conflict, how they've own success if they're giving it to a team or trying to take it all from themselves. So it's it's a relatively light conversation, but you know, that'll start to shine through pretty quickly given the right questions are asked. And and that's really what they're trying to get at is just that, you know, foundationally, are we aligned from from that no ego? Are they a lifelong learner? We're also looking for some positive things like what's the last thing you've taught yourself? And it doesn't have to be work related. Like I've taught myself how to build a birdhouse. Okay, so they're they're passionate about learning. They want to do those things, or they talk how to play guitar, whatever. So you're looking for the pros and the cons uh, in regards to that. It's also interesting if I if I remember correctly from your notes before we met her that you're you, it said that your turnover rate is five percent or less. Yeah. So pre I should say pre COVID. We were for a long time sub 5%. Now we've been attacked by the same problem everybody else has had going on here. Now, what I can say is for agencies, we are still below what I will call normal time turnover. So for agencies, normally they're at like 20 to 30%. We're still well below that. For me, it's super uncomfortable. I hate turnover. With growth, I think the thing I'm learning is you have to be okay with maybe a little bit more. When you grow, there's a lot of things that change. You have to Im- impose more processes and procedures. Some people like that small company feel. Some people like a little bit of, a, of, of that process and stuff. And so I think part of it is also recognizing we aren't the right fit for some of the people that used to be the right fit for us. And both of us have to be okay with that. So we've had some great people leave, but in a positive way. And I've looked at those as celebrations. We just had an individual. She was with us for five years, I think. And my parting conversation was, hey, let's just celebrate. Remember our first conversation. And I gave her a few, you know, <laughs> here's what I remember about it. And said, yeah. And I said, I want you to just in this moment, reflect about what you knew about visual marketing in that moment compared to today. And let's think about how far you've come. And I was like, and you have so much more upside. 
go do big things. And I, I like to tell people like that. I'll be your biggest fan. You ever need anything, you let me know. I think societally, we want to look at that as a negative, but turnover can be positive as well and should be celebrated in certain situations as opposed to, oh man, it's a, a terrible thing. And why are they leaving us? And you're mad at them. It doesn't have to be that way. Oh, I, I definitely agree. I mean, th- I think the best leaders put relationships first. And like you yeah. go back to your core value of we, not me. So if you're really thinking we, it means, hey, if this is a good move for that person, I want to celebrate it with them. I want to support them. You know, I want to make it happen. And that, that brings something up. Do you also keep the door open if people want to come back? For certain people, sure. I mean, it, it, it all depends on the, the circumstance of how they left or what their track record was. But yeah, we've definitely had a few people that have come back. And there's several that I would say we would have a very open door for them if they wanted to come back. Yeah, no, it, it makes perfect sense. So uh, I have another question that's eluding me at the moment, but I do. I am curious. I saw something get better 24 in the notes on something you do that's unique. What What is that? Yeah. So like I said, we're a digital agency. So we do SEO and paid search, paid media, Facebook, all that stuff, all the creepy stuff that you think people are listening to. <laughs> <laughs> we don't do that. Um, so we work off of a 40-hour week. So work-life balance is very critical to us. A lot of agencies are pumping out 50, 60 hour work weeks. We restrict it to 40. And of those 40, we put 34 is allocated towards billable time. Super hard to make that perfect. But the six remaining hours is your GB24, your get better 24. Some of that's going to be for internal meetings, all team meetings, different stuff like that. Your one-on-ones. Two of those hours a week though, we want dedicated towards self-development. And It's not a, here's what everybody's doing. We're going to have presentation training for everybody. It's what does this individual need? What does this individual need? And it's an individualized plan. Now, there's going to be lots of group trainings as well. But the point is, we want every person, back to the basketball analogy, if somebody's bad at free throws, that's what they're going to work on in practice. And so there's this individual time to really focus on what do you need to get better as an individual. It could be certifications. We really challenge a lot of our team members. We want people certified in the tools of which they operate on a daily basis. So Google, Facebook, whatever they are, they offer certifications. We want people to get those. And that's what the market wants too. It's a big question we get. What do you do for self-development? Well, that's an easy answer. It's about a $15,000, $16,000 a year investment per person just in time. And then on top of that, we invest real dollars as well. So it's, it's a... It's our strength and training, strength and conditioning portion of our, our workday. Yeah, I don't, I don't think all employees understand that uh, that fifteen to sixteen thousand dollars is real dollars. Right. But those are real dollars. Um, yes. Yeah, they may not see it. Now it sounds like also, though you didn't mention it, that although they're you know you said somebody's missing free throws on the basketball team, they're going to work on free throws. But they're also it sounds like based on them pursuing the certifications. You're also really encouraging them to take their strengths to a new level too. Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. I think that is always a missed or a misperception. I think people always want to only work on their weaknesses. Sometimes you should make your strengths even better. And yeah. so we do, you know, our approach is different than a lot of agencies. Some do it this way, but we have really specific teams. So search engine optimization, but then within that, there's specialties as well. Oh, same with media and so on. And so we, we want people to become really kind of niche experts in different areas. So that that's a benefit to us and our clients. So you have a very specific problem. We can tap that person into the game, come in and solve that very specific problem, and then they can go in and do something else. That's a, a little bit of a unique approach from a lot of people that have more of a generalist approach. And so this time can be used to really build up skills for very specific areas. So how do you maintain the quality of your, I'm shifting gears now, but but it does relate back to culture. How do you maintain the quality of your service as you grow from 10 to 170 people, although it's been over a reasonable amount of time, but how do you maintain that quality? And particularly you've got people, you know, it's like we went out and did some SEO with a company. Okay. We had to manage it about a year and a half and you can blame us, you can blame them, whatever it is. He really didn't do anything. Okay. I mean, I'm just going to be candid. Nice people. Their account managers, their people were pretty rushed when it was the calls. You know, they had obviously some time commitments they had to make. But how do you maintain, maybe it's not quality. 
uh, obviously, if you grew, you were delivering results. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How, how are you keeping an eye on that? So we say we're a data-driven company, so not just for our clients, but for ourselves as well. And, and we absolutely, listen, if we can't defend our value every single month to you as a client, then like shame on us. So we know we live in a retainer world of, you know, there's contracts and stuff, but relatively speaking, a client could downgrade what they're spending with us pretty quickly. And we actually like it that way because we should be defending our existence and adding value. If we're not, that's a, that's a bad equation that doesn't work for anybody in the long run. So, you know, there's different checks and balances in place for all of this, but I think it all starts with hiring and making sure that you do maintain that quality of individual We want people that are super passionate about what they do. They want to be challenged. You know, we have clients that spend a lot of money with us on a monthly basis. They have high expectations as they should. And it it goes back to that partnership and getting everybody bought in partnership with the company they work for, Speedy Tech, as well as our clients and truly buying into what they're trying to accomplish. Those are our victories when we do that. And so if somebody's not down with meeting those expectations, they're just not going to be a fit for us. Yeah, no, it, it it makes sense, and, but it sounds like it's it's the people is huge, but then it also sounds like you've got some systems, and yeah. the, you're really tracking the data. So you're tracking the results. Now, of course, it, it it are the results that you're tracking. Forgive me if I'm asking a stupid question. Are the results you're tracking click throughs, you know, vis- site visits, whatever? Or you actually have access where you're tracking, you know, sales are happening? Yeah, I mean. Every client's a little bit different, but if we can track the specific dollars that converted from a sale. So we know, so ideal situation, we had the full data set from start to finish. So we knew that it'd take one click from Google an organic, you know, they came directly through, they did an organic search and then they clicked on a display ad and they converted, filled out a form. And then that form that they filled out led to a $10,000 sale. So we know it cost us $700 to get to that point but we know that the return was a $10,000 sale. Does that make sense for that client? Now, not every client can provide us that full life cycle from from beginning dollar to end dollar, but when we can, super powerful, and our data team just geeks out on that. We try to deliver as much data as we can to help inform us of what we're doing. And, And some fun things we're doing, and this is again what the market wants, is more a lot of data you're thinking in in the rear view mirror, we're looking forward and trying to predict what's going to happen. So a great story, one of our clients, they came and challenged us. We want to go from X leads to X leads, doubling it. And team dug into the data and said, here's what's the search volume. Here's what it's going to cost. Listen, we can only get halfway there. Client CMO is like, no, it has to be here. Let's go through it again. Three times we've gone through it. And this is living to our core values. We didn't just try to sell. We, We did the right thing, right? And so after the third time, you guys, thank you. I appreciate your honesty. A lot of agencies would have just tried to take our dollars and we would have been both been in big trouble in 90 days. Now you've given me the power and information of how what I'm going to do with it. Do I go into the CEO's office and say, hey, we can get there and lie? Or am I going to tell them, here's the reality of where we can get to, but I'm very confident in us getting there and here's what it's going to cost it just changes the conversation. And it's not a, about us trying to say we're right. It's this is what the data is telling us. And we have a track record of that being right. So we're now predicting the future with that, which is that's super fun stuff. But what about the situation? And I have shifted gears substantially here, but what about the situation where I, I'm, I'm reading, I'm not an expert and we don't do a lot of marketing podcasts here, but I'm curious I'm reading more about social media, you know, maybe not being as popular, there being problem privacy, there's limits where people are yanking stuff, whatever it might be, but, and it's, and the cost is going through the roof. So what is a company supposed to do that really wants to go out there and try to get leads and social media has worked in the past for many companies, but they're seeing all these question marks now. How did, how does your team assess that with them? To really confirm, hey, this will work for you, or like you just said, it may work for you, but it's not going to work as much as you think, at least initially, or it's not going to work for you at all. H- how do they do that? Yeah. So there's a lot of layers to this. So one, we want to have a full funnel thinking or uh, approach to the to that ecosystem. Meaning, 
got to have awareness, you have to have consideration, and then they've got to close. They've got to take the action that we want from, from a sales perspective. And what I would say is, you know, Facebook may not work for some people, Instagram may not work for some people, but on the flip side, it does work for some people. You just have to have the right data to actually measure. So here's how many dollars I'm putting out. What am I getting in return for that? And so for some companies, yeah, Facebook may be dried up. LinkedIn may be where you need to go, much more focused, more expensive, but is your cost per lead, per conversion, whatever you're thinking of, where it needs to be. So, you know, you asked earlier about what metrics, they're different for every client. We, we really want to have a tailored set of measurements for each client to make sure that it's, it's the health monitor for that client. And we want to fail fast. First attempt in learning, fail. So this, if we can fail fast, we're going to reduce the amount of wasted spend and try to create efficiencies in spend as quickly as possible. And so digital marketing is oftentimes you throw stuff against the wall, you see what works. And what falls, you pick it up and you try it someplace else. And you just kind of that constant challenging. And and when something's working, you ride that for as long and as hard as you can. When it stops working, you got to don't try to die on that mountain. You abandon that fairly quickly and move those dollars to something else. Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. So I think, Mark, what I'd like to do is, is close out here. You made some great points on culture. And Is there a place on your website where people can learn more about your culture? And then, of course, they may learn more about your company. Yeah. So if you go to spinutech.com, S-P-I-N-U-T-E-C-H.com, there is under the about section, you can get into some of the culture and and, and stuff. We've got some fun YouTube videos. And then also, I talk a lot about this on LinkedIn. So you can look myself up, Mark Reichmath, on LinkedIn. I'm happy to connect about that and have conversations. I'm obviously very passionate about it. Uh, but try to make posts regularly about culture, core values, things like that as well. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I I love the stuff about culture. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Love it. Thanks for having me.